Before we jump into this, and before I introduce my guest, real quick, I just wanted to say, because I've had a number of people reach out and ask this question, um, I've been in touch with Miss May, one fab teacher from YouTube. She lives in Houston or just outside, and, and uh, so she's by the storm. She's okay. She's living right now with her brother and his family. Uh, she left her house. I don't know if she was required to evacuate or not, but she left there. Uh, school's been canceled until sometime next week to start the year, and they're in a house with no power, and that's all I really know right now, but I know that they're safe. So if you're if you're watching this and you would like to help Miss May, you can go to her YouTube channel or you can uh, find her at Twitter uh, on Twitter and you can find links that you can help to donate money to her and her family in this time. So again, like if you're just tuning in, I've been in contact with Miss May and she asked me to just make an announcement and I'm going to make a video about this this evening that she's okay and that she's in Houston, Texas. And, but it just, she said, it's just awful. Um, they're in a house without electricity right now, but, uh, she, so she can't even like upload a video or let everyone know that she's okay, but she is okay. Uh, she and her family are fine, um, living in her brother's house. But, uh, as I learn more about that, I'll keep everyone in touch because it's really great. Like this, this community of educators that has kind of sprung up on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook, I mean, even long before I've been on here, but uh, it's really, it's, it's it's amazing. And so like, if you can help, you can, uh, you can email me and I'll put you in touch with the, with the right places so that you can help Miss May and her family out. Um, aside from that, we're going to talk education tonight. I have a really great guest from Instagram, Miss Urban Educator, and she is a seventh grade teacher, I believe, in New York. And uh, yeah, we don't get a lot of middle school on here or high school people on here, so I'm excited to have this conversation tonight. If you have questions about anything, you can go ahead and leave them in the box on the side there on you now or in the comment section below on YouTube. And if you're catching this as part of the rebroadcast, you can still leave questions, and I will do my absolute best to get back to those questions. Um, because I think that they're important to answer. So we're going to talk a little bit tonight about a topic that I really like, um, and then we'll take questions that you have about just about anything. Um, yeah, Kate, she's, she's good. Aaron, she was talking about both of you last night when we were on the phone together. Um, I'm just waiting for my guest to show up. Um, oh, there she is. Hold on one second. Here we go. She's guesting in now. Yeah, I wrote it there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. I'm glad that you made it this evening. Um, sorry, that took a little longer, but I forgot I had to talk about my friend, Miss May, who's been in all kinds of trouble down in Houston. Um, so it's it's a terrifying situation down there. Um, but... uh. But that this we're not going to talk about that right now. We're going to talk about being a teacher and uh, and help, trying to help some people out. So, uh, could you give everyone like a little bit of a like a snapshot of like who you are, where you teach, that kind of a thing? Okay, so I'm Lakeisha. I am a proud middle school teacher in New York City. Um, I teach eighth grade. I currently teach eighth grade. I did teach seventh grade for four years, um, but I current this is my second year teaching eighth grade. I teach humanities, which means that I teach one period of ELA and one period of social studies. Oh, okay. Now, so how long have you been doing that? This will be my second year. Okay. Um, Traditionally, yeah. I'm an ELA teacher. Okay, that's uh. What what brought you into teaching? Um, well, it's a very long story, but um, I had really great relationships with teachers throughout my entire academic career. Um, but when I was in middle school, I struggled a lot um, emotionally because of things that were going on at home. And I was difficult. And my teachers like were also understanding um and really forgiving and so like i'll i always remember that and so that's why i chose to be a middle school teacher because um i know that those years are very important years and you know young people are really trying to get to know who they are and they have all these emotions and they don't really know how to handle it so i want to be there like i want to be that buffer i want to be the one to kind of talk them through and be that support for them during those years 
Wow. So did you grow up in the area where you're teaching or did you grow up somewhere else? No. So I currently teach in Manhattan, um, but I grew up in Jamaica, Queens, um, and I taught in Jamaica, Queens for four years. So this position that I'm in in Manhattan is a fairly new one. Okay. Um, that's awesome. So did you know, is this school, is it new or is it a charter school or where, no, where are you? No, it's a public school. It's a six through 12, um, public school. The school I was at in, um, Queens is also a six through 12 school. Um, yeah, no, it's not a new school, Okay, but it, it's um, a screen, it's a screen school. So that basically just means that students have to like, um, come on an interview. They have to meet, um, certain attendance requirements, uh, state oh. test scores, et cetera. Okay. But so you know, that's not a magnet school then, right? No, no, no. Okay. Okay. All right. Just trying to draw that distinction there. So on your, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Ainer and for some reason, <laughs> um, they, on your Instagram, one of the things that you have, uh, in your bio at the top is frugal. And I love that because one of the things that I'm always preaching to my students is this idea of making something from nothing, like take what does not already exist and get yourself out of like whatever you have uh available to you so what what role does frugality play in your classroom can you kind of like paint a picture for that and where did that come from yes so um for the first five years of my public school teaching career i was in title one school and so um you know my students didn't really have a lot of resources the schools were underfunded um and so there were a lot of ideas that I had and a lot of ways I wanted to be creative, but the school couldn't provide me with that. And I couldn't ask my, um, you know, the parents to, you know, support me in certain ways because they just didn't have it. So I had to make the best of what I had. So um, I remember one summer, actually it was three summers ago, and um, I was in Dollar Tree and I realized that they have a whole entire teaching section. And I was like, oh, okay, this is interesting. And as I started browsing through, I noticed that there were borders and the letters and I'm like, Oh, I just spent six dollars at the the teacher store for these letters, and they're a dollar here. And so yeah. that's why I was like, okay, wait, let me explore this a little bit deeper. And so I started visiting multiple Dollar Trees and like Targets, Dollar Spot, and then I noticed that all of a sudden, all of these stores started providing teachers with resources that were affordable. So things that we typically pay four dollars for, you can get for a dollar or 50 cents from Dollar Tree or Target. And so I was like, you yeah. know what? Let me start sharing these resources on social media. And I just went and posted a couple of pictures. And then I realized there was a whole teacher community out there. And so that's how my Instagram page started. So what is like, what are some of your go-to places to make, like, I know I have my own secret stuff and sometimes I want to share that. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want everyone <laughs> to know about this in my spot. I'm like, but like, what are some of your go-to places for that? Okay, well, the obvious ones. I think everyone knows Target. Um, I think a lot of people are now starting to realize that Dollar Tree is very valuable because at Dollar Tree, you can even get like book baskets and different, you know, little things. With Dollar Tree, you just have to spend time and like think about, mm, okay, how can I use this? And you'll realize that there are really multiple ways you can use a lot of the products there. Yeah. Um, I love Five Below. Um, Five Below doesn't have... Um, a lot of items that are specific to teachers, but yeah. like um, everyone's into like these emoji pillows now in their classrooms and flexible seating. Um, there are a lot of like um, marker scented markers and stuff there. So you can just get things for discount, discounted prices. Um, Walmart is really great. Um, um, I recently visited Hobby Lobby. There aren't any Hobby Lobbies in my area, but when I visited Florida, I went to Hobby Lobby and I saw a lot of resources there as well. Um, but mainly um, Target, Dollar Tree, and Five Below. Yeah, I, I think one of my favorite new spots is, um, so I just posted a video on YouTube where I made, uh, fly, I taught people how to make flying books. I have all these flying books that hang from my ceiling. In oh, my room. nice. And it was, it's, almost free like it's if you have like fishing line in your house an old book and i only use books that are like like i i got a bunch of copies of uh remember who kato kalen was in the oj trial he was a guy like, like lived behind oj sin during his trial and he was like a totally weird dude he made an autobiography that like no one bought so i found copies of it at my <laughs> library they were giving it away so i just cut them up and i made these flying books and 
So with some fishing line and with like a eye hook, you can just hang them anywhere in your room and they look great and it's practically free. So I think with a little bit of ingenuity, you can make stuff. And But one of my favorite spots is uh, Facebook Marketplace, which is just Everyone like Craigslist. Yeah, it's really, it's just like Craigslist, but it's so much easier to like communicate with people. You just message them right from Facebook. And I just made this very large caner, uh, this organization container in my room, which is about six feet long, about three feet deep, and it has uh, cubby holes that custom fit all of these different kind of like uh, organizational things I found either at flea markets or at yard sales, Craigslist, Facebook, and it's fun. I, I think it's really fun to, to be creative in that way because I, I think it's a really great lesson for our students. It is. Say, Look, I don't have any money either. Like I always tell my kids, like I dream on a budget. And so my room, I try and make the greatest classroom in the whole school. And I want, and I do that trying to spend as little money as I can, because what I want is for, and this happens all the time, the students will come in, they'll be like, how much money do you spend on stuff? And I'm like, I don't spend a lot of money on any, I spend like typically less than a hundred dollars a year on my room. And with teacher stuff, I mean, that money goes really quickly. Like bulletin board paper, like, and it's it's never anything you use again. Like, no one takes bulletin board paper down and then you reuse it later because it has holes in it and it just gets faded and stuff. So, and it's just fun to get new things. But for me, I like building very very simple objects that have a lot of use in the class. Did you did you grow up frugal? Like, did you get this from your parents or something like that? Or like, how did you be, learn to yes, become creative? Yes, yes, yes. So um, I was raised by two Caribbean parents who were very frugal. Um, they saved their money. The only, um, they spent their money in terms in paying for tuition. Cause I went to Catholic school. I grew up going to Catholic school and I have two sisters. So my, my parents worked and their money went to tuition and to savings. So like we didn't have cable and we didn't have a car and we didn't have those things growing up. So, um, that was really instilled in me, like be very cautious with where you spend and how you spend your money. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, uh, my mom was like, like so my mom passed before Pinterest came out, which is like a shame because my mom would have just loved Pinterest and thought it was the greatest thing. But I think uh, growing up in a in a house where like my mom just made stuff, she never made anything well, right? She would it would we would come home and all of a sudden we would have like no rugs in the living room. My mom was like, I'm gonna try and refinish the hardwood floors. And I'm thinking, <laughs> you have no idea. You don't know how to refinish anything. And she was always creating and making things. And I think that's where I got that kind of sense. Um, plus, like, I just, you know, it's, classrooms are such a rabbit hole in terms of you spend a little bit of money, see what it does, and it makes you want to spend a little bit more money, a little bit more money. And before you know it, like, you could easily spend thousands of dollars on your classroom because, and, and why wouldn't you? I mean, you're in your classroom, a lot of us, more than you're in your own living room. So you want it to look and feel a certain way. And so it's it's easy to go down that rabbit hole, but I think there's tons of ways to like spend your money wisely. What's something, is there a purchase that you made for this coming school year that you were excited about or you found something that, you know, this year or last year that you thought was really amazing? Okay, so actually I found something the other day and I'm really happy about it. So um, I like to hang, uh, uh, what do they call, pennants yeah. uh, in the classroom. And so when I was at Dollar Tree the other day, they had um, an American flag one for, I guess, 4th of July or Memorial Day or something. So I picked it up and I was like, oh my God, like I can use this for my social studies word wall. And I was just so excited because it was just like, okay, like this w thing that's a dollar, it looks great. It goes with my theme. And now like it'll just add an extra element to, you know, the classroom environment. And I think what you said is really important. Classroom environment is so important. I think people see the kind of effort teachers put into it and they wonder why we make such a big deal about it. But like, honestly, the classroom should feel like home for the students. When they Absolutely. walk in, they, there should be a sense of peace. It, it should it should be clean. It should look good. It should show them that, like, the teacher is passionate about them, about the subject. I just feel, you know, classroom environment is just so important. And so, um, like, just the little things really do count. And so, like, that, it just brought me so much joy because I know my students are going to think it's cool. 
Yeah. Yeah, I love back to school night when parents come in my room. A guy come in and as soon as I started speaking, he was like, walk. he was walking out and I said, it was a, so is everything all right? And he goes, yeah, I already, he goes, look at this place. I already know. I don't even need it. I didn't even need to hear you. I was like, oh, all right. I guess that was a compliment. I mean, <laughs> thanks for coming in. A really great rest of the year, but yeah, I, I hear you. I love when students come in and they really like something. I, I teach all, I teach ninth grade literature. I teach all boys school. So for boys to tell you that your room looks nice or that they like something, like that's a big step. Like, um, cause everyone is in ninth grade is trying to act real tough. They're new to the school. And so everyone comes like strutting in my room and they'll just look around and they'll be like, all right, I like that thing. And I'm like, wow, Wow, that was a pretty big deal. Thanks a lot <laughs> for uh, supporting me. I appreciate it. And so that's a, you know, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go no, go for it. Oh no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so it's uh, it's just that that sense of you're right. Like I want to feel comfortable in my room also, and I realize that a lot of teachers at schools. One of the things I get a lot is if someone watches like my classroom tour on YouTube, uh, they get this like. I get a lot of emails saying like, well, I'm not able to put holes in my wall or I can't put tape on my wall or I can't put, um, yeah. what can I do if I, I can't paint? So I have chalkboard paint all over my walls with drawings all over it. And I tell them like, that's the creative part, right? That's the part where you're really going to inspire kids because you're going to figure out ways around those limitations and do something. And plus, I mean, I, I don't want to get anyone in trouble, but I always ask for, forgiveness rather than permission so yes, yes. Um, really stuff in my room i i've had times where i've put literally probably a hundred my wife sitting next to me uh probably a hundred <laughs> holes in my wall because i made these floating bookshelves and i didn't ask anyone if i could do it but as soon as the administrators came at the beginning of the year they loved it they had a hundred questions about it and i'm thinking you have no idea how much damage I did to the <laughs> wall, but so I'm so glad that you like it because if you told me to take it down, it would look like someone Please shot geez. the place up. It, it would look horrific. So uh, yeah, so even if I ever leave that school, I can never take those bookshelves with me because <laughs> it'll just look atrocious in there. Um, I was okay. just gonna say that we have that in common. I taught old boys for four years. Oh really, in New York? Yeah, so the school I was at before is an all boys school. It's like a right. um, a network of all boys schools in New York City, and then there's one in Newark, New Jersey. Okay, I did see a picture on your Instagram, and it was you with a bunch of boys when they yes. were going to the eighth grade dance or something like that. Yes. And yes. Uh, my wife even said she's like, I wonder if she teaches at an all boys school. So yeah, it's uh it's a totally different animal than a co-ed school. It's it's special i just love it i i, I loved would. it too and honestly if i didn't have to leave i wouldn't we had administration issues um that's the only reason why i left but i absolutely loved it absolutely yeah, loved it. it's the best i can't i'm excited for this year to start uh want to jump into some questions from you are, are you you ready to jump into some questions yes yes okay cool so uh first question comes from naturally niani my new school is much more quote unquote urban than where I've been the last 11 years, which I love, but I am spending a lot of time in the class with classroom management, building rapport and redirecting any tips. Uh, what would you say to that? So like if you're someone who's like new to like the urban and trying to build rapport with students and dealing with classroom management, what's, what's your tip on that? I would say the first thing that you have to do is you have to get, to know what your students are interested in. You have to know your students. Once you know your students and what they're interested in, then you can speak to those things. So for example, what I mean is, if you know that a certain student likes um, plays on the basketball team, then that you make an effort to go to that student and check in and say, oh, how was um, practice the other day? Or um, when is your next game? I'd like to come. Um, if you know that there's a student who like is into anime, right? Just, um, you know, asking them to look at their drawings or asking them which, you know, anime book they're reading and talk to them about that. Like you just have to, you build relationships by just identifying what their likes and their interests are. You don't have to necessarily like those things, but you may have to go do a little bit of research on them. Um, and then you just speak to that. So that's what I do. And, um, 
it works a lot for me with the students who um, can be very like resistant in the beginning and for the students who are really shy. So those are always my most challenging students. And so with them, I put an extra effort and it's not fake, it's genuine, you know? They know that I genuinely care about them and it's not, I don't, I'm not overbearing about it either. I'll check in with them. If they wanna talk, they talk. If they don't, it's fine. But at least they know that I'm expressing an interest. And as the days go on, you'll see that they start to respond to you even more. Um, yep. You know, giving students um, incentives. You know, I'm big on, like, I always have a bag of mints or candy or something, and I walk around, and if I see that they're doing effort, I'll put a little mint down next to them. It's little things that matter. And what students, all teachers know that Students, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what your background is, students just appreciate someone who is genuine. And so once they see that you genuinely care about them, then they'll respond positively to you. So, um, and don't give up on them. That's another thing because they, a lot of them are used to people giving up on them, whether it's at home, whether it's teachers that they had before, whether it's school administration, you never know what they're dealing with, but they, a lot of them are used to people giving up on them and show them, okay, you know, you're not really responding to me right now. You know, you want to, you know, act out right now, but I'm not going to give up on you. I still believe in you and I'm still going to put an effort to get to know you and to make a connection with you. And you just, it's, it's hard at first, but once you keep working on it, the better, as the years go on, the better you get. Yeah. I, you know, I think you brought up something interesting there that kind of ties into one of my ideas of this is that I think sometimes teachers don't want to do that stuff because they want to seem like they're trying to be cool. So I, one, of, one of the things I'll do is like, I'll, if I know all the kids are excited about a movie that's coming out, even if I'm not particularly interested, I might go see the movie because it gives me something to talk about. Or last year, there was this uh, one J. Cole song that came out that all the kids kept talking about. And I'm like... I'm, I'm, so I teach a, a history of hip hop class mm -hmm. at my school. And so the kids know that I like hip hop, but I'm, I'm the, I'm the guy that likes old hip hop and not so much the new hip hop. Cause it does. And my argument there is that it just doesn't like speak to my life. Like, uh, I, I'm a, I get it. Like I'm 41 year old white dude from New Jersey. Like I'm not, I can't listen to little Uzi and be like, yeah, this is my jam. So, so, but I will, if I know all the kids are really into something, I will listen to it or watch it. Or uh, last year I started watching maybe my least favorite show that I've ever had to watch. Uh, my students were real into love and hip hop on VH1, which is like one of the worst I've seen. And, but I watched it because then I would take that episode that I watched and I'd base my vocab lesson on it. And I'd be like, yo, last week, this is what went down on, on love and hip hop and the kids like couldn't believe it. But then it also gave them something they knew to relate the words to or like uh, to draw on when they were had the test. They're like, oh, that's when Reynolds said that crazy thing about the show. And, you know, and even like years ago when Jersey Shore was real big on MTV, I started watching that and I remember my wife came home and she was like, what in the world are you watching? And I was like, this is for school. I'm doing research right now and I'm getting ready for school. And then my vocab lessons for the whole year were based on uh, on Jersey Shore because that's what all the kids were watching. And so I think what I tell the students is that I'm not, not trying to be cool or down hall. What I'm trying to do is I'm doing, I'm watching this on purpose because I care so much about you that I'm willing to watch sometimes the worst stuff I've ever seen in my life just so that I can help you learn. And I think when kids see that about you, that you're willing to go to those lengths, that really, really makes an impact. And along the lines of like you leaving the mints on people's desks, I like, uh, sometimes I'll write like on a post-it note, because especially with all boys, the, the boys do not like shout it out all the time. Some guys do, some guys cannot get enough of it. They just eat it up. And then other kids, get real shy if you compliment them in class. So I'll just write like a little quick note on a post-it note. I keep them in my pocket and I'll say like, great job. Or I like what you did there. I appreciate your curiosity or good question. And then I just put it on the desk next to them and nobody else has to know about it. Only they do. And that helps. I mean, I think when you do that stuff, you see kids sit up a bit straighter or they respect you more. You stand out because not all the other teachers are doing that. So it really sets you apart in a really positive way. So yeah, that was a great answer. Um, Queen de la Classroom is saying, 
Tips for dealing with three students or students who don't care. Uh, I'm sure we've had these. I know I've had both of those students before multiple times. Um, what do you do with kids that are excessively angry in class or like when they just don't want to do anything? Um, well, I think the first thing is to acknowledge that there's always something else going on, right? So when they're and when they're angry, I don't think the best solution is for you to respond in the same way. Um, you know, you can ask them, you know, to just step outside and have a conversation with them. And I always start out gently, like, okay, like, is everything okay? You know, um, you know, I saw you when you came in this morning, you looked, you know, kind of upset is everything okay, like trying to get at the root of what the issue is first. Um, some of the time, they'll respond and let you know, yeah, you know, I got, you know, an argument with my brother this morning and whatever. And I'll say, okay, well, just go take a walk, go get a drink of water. If you want to sit here in the hallway for a little bit, sit. And then when you're ready, come back in. Or I'll bring their book out to them and say, if you want to read in the hallway, you can. But the, see, the thing is, I'm in a school right now that um, kind of uh, is uh, allows that kind of uh, response. Um, but I've been in environments that haven't, in environments that are very strict and rigid and everything is about going to the dean and um, being on suspension and stuff. And, um, you know, I'm not in favor of that as being the first response. So in those environments, I still tried to one on one get to the root of the issue. Then if I had to send them to someone, send them to someone who... Um, would be gentle with them. So for example, like in my old school, our founding principal, he was very amazing with the boys. So I would send him, send that student to him before I sent the student to a dean, because I knew that this particular student needs to be handled in this particular way. So that's another thing, you have to know your students, you know, um, because all of our students, there are triggers to everything. You know, a student can be fine, but there maybe this person's um, uncle is a trigger for them, and the uncle came to the house, and so now that has set them off. So you have to understand the student and understand the triggers. The only way you can do that is talking to the parents, talking to them, you know what I mean, making phone calls, and again, like not, you know, being aggressive um, about it and being very negative. I feel like with parents, you know, these are their kids. This is, they love these children and you have to be very gentle with them, you know, and let them know that we are a community and we're trying to work together to help this child grow and overcome these particular issues. And I feel like when you develop that kind of relationship with parents and you approach it in that way, it becomes easier. Now, it's not, that's not the remedy for everything, right? Because we've all had those situations with the kid who blows up, the one who throws the book bag, throws a chair, whatever the case is, and then you do have to call a dean. But again, I feel like it all goes back to relationships and realizing these are children. They don't understand how to manage all of these feelings and these emotions. And as the adult who's supposed to um, you know, protect them and be there for them, you have to really get at the root of what is going on. And like I said, because I was that kid, I understand that. You know, my my attitude wasn't because I was this horrible person. It was because I was upset about something that happened before I came to school. You yeah. know? Yeah. My my wife keeps saying amen as she's sitting there. <laughs> right now. Um, because I, I'm, I am so on the same page with you. Uh, now, I, I will say that it, it, it does depend on the kids. So there are some kids that I will come down harder on um, because I know that that's what they they need like I have a pretty good sense of that sort of thing but if someone's angry I'd never come down hard on them I would do the same thing I'd say do me a favor you're not in trouble I just need you to step in the hallway for a second so I can speak to you that's it and then because what that's going to do is take away the audience they don't have to look tough it's just them and I and then my first thing I say if when this happens like the first couple of times is I'll say I really I must have done something to upset you so if I did I I apologize, but like, you please tell me so that I could remedy it. And I think that catches kids so off guard. Yes, that, it and does. I know that. Like nine times out of 10, I didn't do anything, but sometimes <laughs> I did. Like I might've said the wrong thing or they read something wrong when I made a joke, but nine times out of 10, they'll go, oh, it has nothing to do with you. And I'm like, oh, well, what could it possibly be then? And then kids are, when there's no audience, are very, most guys will just, talk and, and it's very easy to kind of like pull it out of them find out what's going on, and then take it from there but you know most of the time it has nothing to do with you but as the teacher when you're in the front of the room and you just see someone that has like a scowl on their face 
and they look like they're ready to punch you in the teeth. You know, you, you take it personally, but you didn't find out that like they had a fight with their mom right before they got out of the car this morning. Or, you know, they, uh, I had a kid last year. I had no idea because it was on his back. He was waiting for the bus. It was raining. The bus went by and soaked him all down his back. And so he was miserable. And I thought, well, rightfully so, one, but why don't you come and say something to someone? So the next week it happened again, comes into school. He's like, Reynolds, I need you to go find a dryer and put my pants in it because it splashed by the bus again, which I'm thinking like, first of all, could you please stop waiting on like so close to the curb, like back up a little bit. But uh, yeah, like I think just taking that little bit of time and, and finding out what's going on and really like you can whittle kids down pretty easily. I, I've, uh, you know, ask a kid to come after school. Yo, check in with me after school. Not in trouble. I just want to talk to you. And then I think that really helps. And I think the same thing with kids that, that don't care. They don't care for a reason. Everyone wants to be successful. They want to do a good job. They want to make you happy as their teacher, whether they show it or not. And so as, as long as you show that they really care, um, that handles all of your problems. Not all of them, but it will handle a lot of the problems. Uh, one swim chick is asking, uh, did your first year of teaching in the classroom look anything similar to how it appears now? That's a really good question. Wait, I didn't uh, keep the question? Yeah, sure. Did your first year teaching look anything like your classroom now appears? Not at all. <laughs> so what, what did, paint that picture for us. What did the first year look like for you? Okay, <laughs> so um, my first year teaching, I taught um, ninth and 11th grade English. Um, in a school in Bedford Stuyvesant, Stuyvesant Brooklyn. Um, it was a Title I school, a fairly new school. And it was one of those schools that looks pretty, but you know, there, in terms of administration, there really wasn't any substance. So we had like a million dollar trading room floor because it was donated by a politician and whatever. But all of our students were like, like my ninth grade students were probably on like a fourth grade reading level. Um, we had no resources in the school whatsoever. We had like a few things in the book closet, but that was this uh, split between all four grades. Um, and you know, it was just, <laughs> it was hectic. Okay. Um, a lot of my students, their parents um, were incarcerated or had been incarcerated. A lot of them had been incarcerated themselves. Like a lot of my um, male students had been um, in the uh, youth uh, part of Rikers Island. Um, and um, I attended a really great teacher preparation program, but it didn't prepare me to teach in that kind of environment. It taught me how to like teach students who were on grade level and above grade level, but not students who were struggling and had those kind of um, like home situations. So it was a major, major challenge. And so that that's why I stress um, and emphasize relationships so much because that was the only way I was able to connect with them. I didn't come from a background like that. My back, you know, they. I taught predominantly African American students, but my experience as an African American was completely different. You know, my parents both went to college, et cetera. So I just came from a different background. So in that respect, I was very different from them. Um, however, by developing relationships with them, I was able to really, um, get a lot done. I, that's where a lot of, I guess, my, um, creativity also started to come up and, and finding affordable ways to really like engage my students and, um, create a classroom environment that was appealing to them because I had literally had nothing to work with. And so um, it was just that kind of environment where it was like the teachers, we were all together helping helping each other and really trying to help these kids. And that's all we really had. Um, and every day I left and I cried. I had many moments when I broke down crying at school. The kids would run out. Oh, my Miss Alam is crying. Miss Alam is crying. So I had those moments crying because people would come in my in the middle of my lesson. Someone would break in my room and start a fight. 
you know, a fight would break out between my own students during a lesson. So it was just, it, it was mayhem, but I learned so much. And those kids were so amazing. And they taught me so much. They taught me so much about love. They taught me so much about just what it really means to be a good teacher. They taught me that no matter, no matter, like, it's just, like what you were saying, like the kids who don't care, most of my students came off as those kids who didn't care. But then because I built a relationship with them and had really real conversations with them about life and college and the future, like these were all students when it came down to their um, Regis exam. Those are the state test in New York City for high school students. They were buckling down, coming to Saturday for Regis prep, staying after school to get help. Oh, the same kids who in September and October didn't care, were cursing me out, were fighting. Now, you know, we're in, you know, January and they're all into like, oh, no, no, we want to do well. I took them to college fairs, you know, all those kind of things. So it, that really taught me what it meant to be a teacher. And so that's why I always feel like when, um, Te pre that pre-service teachers should have a, a, var a varied experience. Um, I feel like they should have, you know, a, str a school that's like, you know, with struggling students and, and low resources, and then like an average school or, you know, a school that is more affluent or whatever. I think there needs to be a balance because you can learn so much from both environments. And I feel like I am the teacher that I am today because I was in that type of environment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I've only ever taught in Title I schools for the last 12 years. And when I went in, I had this idea of what I thought it would be like. But I mean, teaching is like, I tell new teachers that teaching is like swimming. Like college is everyone talking about swimming and showing videos about swim and telling you what, what water is going to be like. But you know how to swim until you swim. Like you have to get in the water to actually do it. And when I, I remember going in and I was so concerned about what I looked like. Like it wasn't, I mean, I was centered on the kids and I wanted them to learn, but I didn't want to like lose my job. I didn't want to look like a fool. I didn't want, uh, I feel like if I, I even kicked kids out, that was going to look poorly on me. And I think this many years in, I'm, I'm much more relaxed. I care very, very minimally about what anyone thinks because I know that I'm getting along with the students. So if someone walks in my room and my lesson might not look like much, but I know if it's well or not. And so I just am not so concerned. I'm more willing, I, I'm very silly by nature, by nature, and I like to use humor in the classroom. That's my number one classroom management tool. So I'll do things like uh, if kids are gonna fight, I used to just freak out and not know what to do. And now my kid's like, you can, look, I see where this is going. And if you fight, you're going to have to just break it up by yourselves because I am <laughs> too old to break fights up anymore. And a lot of times that helps. Or I have, uh, I'll play the love song from Karate Kid 2. I just have it queued up on my computer all the time. And if there are love songs playing, dudes don't want to fight. They do not want to have a fight. If I have like some loud love jam or like Barry White song that comes on. And it, I think when you do that, I, what I'm saying is like, that doesn't work all the time, but... I'm more willing to do like a little bit crazier stuff now than when I first started teaching. I'm not as worried that like, like the, I think one of the interesting things about teaching at a title one school is you have kids that a lot of times have like sort of raised themselves because if mom, if mom's the only one at home and she's working two jobs and you sometimes are at grandma's house, you've had to learn how to like, like cook and clean and wash and clothes. Like, you know how to take care of yourself. So I'm not, you're not dealing with as much kind of silly behavior. Like, uh, it's, it's much more like from that place of, or I don't care. And, uh, and so I just, I'm more willing to like confront a lot of that stuff head on too, where I used to be kind of nervous. Like, I don't know what that dude's going to do if I confront him about this. And now it's just like, no, I don't, I don't care. And I think kids love that when you are not willing not afraid to have a, a talk with a student yep. or confront them about something. I, I think kids eat that stuff up because they've been craving it their whole lives. It's true. So, it's, it's definitely yeah. true. So it, it helps. Uh, what's one that? Under, right under. Okay. So there's uh, qu this question and then there's one that goes with this question. So S Boone is asking, I'm subbing nine through 11 grade ELA for the first week and a half of school. Any tips on how to handle the class? What kind of work do you, you do with sub plans when every student knows not their real teacher? And then the other question that goes along with that is, 
they also asked, what would, what would you want in a, a sub in my position to do if you were the real teacher? So have you, have you I, substituted before? I didn't hear the second question. Uh, the second part was, if you were the real teacher, what would you want your sub to do in that situation? Okay, so I've never subbed before, <clears throat> um, but I can talk about what I what I've seen in terms of successful subs versus unsuccessful subs. Um, first, I want to say just being a sub in general is such a difficult position for anyone to be in, you know. And I really, really feel for you um, because you know subs have such a great heart and they really want to um, do well and cater to the kids. But the kids could just be difficult because, like you said you know, they know that you're not their real teacher. Um, the successful subs that I have seen, in addition to whatever sub plans are left, they bring in their own bag of tricks. So I've seen a lot of subs come in, they've had icebreakers, they've said, um, oh, you know, you guys are doing short stories, this is a, um, one of the favorite short stories um, that I like, and they give them a little background about why they like the story. Um, they walk around and they have conversations with the kids and like the kids just love that. They love when the subs like get involved with them. The subs who are too laid back or too authoritative, the kids are very resistant to. Yeah. So I guess my advice would be like, bring your own, um, bag of tricks with you. However you want to connect with the students, do some type of like icebreaker, getting to know you activity and, you know, just really show them that you care. Um, you know, it is difficult. And then for me as a teacher, um, I like when I come back and the work is actually done, you know, yeah. but I know my students and I'm realistic about my students and I know which ones are going to give the sub a hard time. Um, and so I'll even like leave notes like, okay, you know, a few of them may be resistant, just, you know, write the name down. Or what I like to do is I choose this. I actually started this for the first time last year. I never did this before. I ch I choose a um, student in the class who I know is um, very organized and who the kids respect. And I leave that student's name in the subfolder and I say, Maya will help you. Um, and so Maya will write, you know, the agenda on the board. Maya will make sure things are handed out and work one on one with the sub. And that has been so successful. So if you can identify right away a student, you know, or I don't know, well, you said the first week of school, so I don't know if you'll be able to, you know, communicate with the teacher, but yeah. a student who the students respect and who is also responsible um, to help the sub is really beneficial. Yeah, I, I think one of the things I, I love about teaching is um, I feel like kids, so my guys are 14, 15 years old, and I, when we have conversations, they're so eager to talk. Because I, it almost feels like no one ever asks them their opinion about stuff. And if I think about it, I don't know how many times I was asked my opinion as a 14-year-old. Uh, Never. And, <laughs> and so if you just go in and say, hey, what do you th think about this? Like I would, I, depending on your class, and you, you could feel out different conversations. But um, I know that like if I was teaching when when what happened in charlottesville happened in charlottesville i'd go in and say you guys think about this like mm -hmm. what's your what's your takeaway on this like let's have a conversation and i'll bet you could easily have a conversation on that or you could show like a movie but like um not in a lazy way like i always tell people like if you watch a movie like watch it and then and when there's a point where there's a talk about pause it and say does anyone catch what's going on here or what do you think or what would you do in this situation or how do you feel about it how does this make you feel and then create some kind of dialogue behind it in the classroom. And then, you know, to be honest, if a sub came in and told me like, you know, I just did my own thing for the day, but like we learned, we had a really great conversation. Um, these students really said something that was meaningful. I would be totally thrilled with that. You know, it's a, I'm out. Like I, I, I don't, I have bigger things probably. It's probably, if I was out, it means like my children are throwing up all night or something like that. So uh, I think, you're right. Coming up with like your own bag of tricks or maybe you have a certain article that you read or a point that you want to discuss or a song you want to talk about. Like, you know, I think that works really, really well. And I think, yeah, not being too, too strict. Someone has to go to the bathroom. You let them go to the bathroom. If they, if they stay out for 30 minutes, write a note to the teacher. Like, you know, don't, you know, what are you going to do? Hunt them down? Like it, it's, it's all right. <laughs> so, uh, what's this one? Um, so yeah, I just think that that is, I, I think you're completely on point with, with that answer. Uh, 
Oh, I'm going to ruin this name. Uh, Nay Nayara Al Almedia? I apologize. I just ruined your name, but I'm like dreadful with names all these years of teaching. Uh, do you, it says, do you folks have any international students or immigrants know English? If yes, how do you teach kids who do not understand the language? Have you, I mean, you teach ELA, so what's... Okay, so back to my school, my very first school, the one in Brooklyn. Um, yeah. In the middle of the year, I received a group of students, um, uh, maybe like three or four of them only spoke Spanish. Four of them um, spoke Arabic. Um, and two of them were from, I believe, Guinea. One, or, or it was um, a French speaking African country. And they right. only, well, one only spoke the tribal language. And the other one, she spoke a little bit of French. They were plopped right in the middle of my regular gen ed. Um, actually it wasn't, it was my ICT class. So it was like the, um, like 40% special ed, 60% gen ed class. So they were a part of that class. So I was like, okay, I don't know what I'm going to do because we didn't have an ESL program. Um, so all I did was I went and I bought a bunch of like kindergarten, first grade workbooks for like sight work. Right. So because I said, OK, well, they can recognize these pictures. And so like once I set up my um, the class and um, the, the uh, general ed students and got them working, then I would pull that group to the back and we would just go through the workbooks and I would pronounce the, um, you know, uh, point to the picture and I would pronounce the word for them and then they would write it and then we would do sounds. I mean, like that's what I said, like <laughs> that kind of environment really shows you what it means to be a teacher because you just have yeah. to make it work and you can't fail these kids um so and then eventually maybe a few months in we got like a um a, some type of esl program but it was only for one period so that so they at least were able to have one like traditional esl class but they were still my students throughout the year and i just worked with them at their individual pace so i can't give like professional esl help but if you're in that kind of position, just start with the basics, the way you would teach a, you know, a, a four-year-old or a five-year-old, like kind of start that way. Um, you have more to work with because they're older and they can recognize things, you know, it's not like they don't know anything. They're not blank slates at all. Um, yeah. But in this field, you really just, you have to serve the kids and by any means necessary. So, yeah, I think you're a hundred percent right. And, and so I've had kids when I taught in, I used to teach in Camden, New Jersey was my first school. And I would get students often from either Puerto Rico or from Dominican Republic that spoke no English at all. And I speak like three words of Spanish. So <laughs> it was me. I would always find another student that spoke the same language. Um, and I would say, because generally, I think Spanish was the only other language that I was dealing with besides English. So I would find someone else to kind of communicate to kids. But I would ask them to come after school or I'd meet them like in the hallway or something like that. And just the number one thing I wanted them to understand was that more than anything in the whole world, I wanted them to be successful. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think communicating that to students and just saying it in plain language really goes far sometimes because kids aren't used to hearing that. And then I think being 100% honest with your students all the time is the best policy. So saying something like, look, I realize that this is a first grade workbook, right? But this is where we are. But mm -hmm. I swear to you, I'm going to do everything I can to bring you up to where you need to be. And so, like, this is where we're starting. And this is, like, it's what has to happen. But, like, I don't think that you're a little kid or anything. But, like, let's let's start there. And, and I, I think when you're honest with kids and you are and you show that you're passionate and you let them know that it's important kids are apt to do a lot of things that they wouldn't normally do and it helps them to not like because I, I immigrant students that i've dealt with before a lot of times they can like they'll either stay in their shell or they act out or they just act like they never know what you're saying even though you know you find out six months later that they've actually learned how to speak english and you're like yeah. oh you've just been pretending for six months yeah. yep. <laughs> you know what i was saying but uh but because I, the one student I had that came from Dominican Republic, I was walking through the cafeteria one day 
I didn't think he still knew any English. And he was like talking to some girl, like trying to schmooze her. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Like, I hear you. <laughs> but like when you have to like kick it to someone, all of a sudden now you like can speak perfect English. But in, in my class, you just look at me like, like with like a deer, it's eye, you know, caught in the headlights. So yeah, I think that uh, that connection with students, I, I feel like we keep going back to that theme, but like connection so important. Because it says so many things to kids that lets them feel safe, lets them feel able to, to be able to take a risk, um, lets them know they're not going to be made fun of, you're not going to laugh at them, you're not going to up on them. And that means everything in, in, in life. I'd like to um, say one last thing um, about that. I think it's yeah. also, it also shows that there are different measures um, for success. You know, um, my those students weren't going to be able to read of mice and men and analyze it and write a five page um, essay on it at the end of the year. But if they had if they were able to communicate better um, in English because of my class, then for me that and then I was successful. So yeah. as teachers, we have to understand that there, there are different levels of success and it's not going to necessarily look the same way for every single student. Yeah, that's a, that's exactly right. And, and communicating that to kids. Look. I don't expect you to be reading a novel by yourself at the end of the year. Let's figure out a metric, and then that's where we're gonna that's what we're gonna reach for mm -hmm. for the end of the year, and that's good for you. Uh, that's a really good point. So, uh, the Scottish Teaching Ninja, it, which is one of my favorite uh, usernames <laughs> on the internet. Any advice on building confidence of very quiet and shy students? I tend to give good advice, but I'm worried that he is too uh, too quiet and needs more. What uh, what what would you do? What do you you, what have you done in the past? You have like a really shy or quiet student. How do you help them out? Yeah, I touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, and I'm thinking in particular about a student that I had last year who was really quiet. And so with her, um, I always just walked around, checked in with her. She And she like she spoke very quietly. Like everything about the way she operated was just very quiet and very like closed off. And so I just I just observed her. And I realized that she's an art, an artist. She loves to draw. And so I would say, oh, uh, do you mind drawing me a picture? And like her whole face lit up. And she was like, oh, you want me to draw you a picture? I'm like, yeah. So then she drew me a picture almost every day for the rest of the school year. And you know what I did? <laughs> I hung it on my whiteboard. So literally at the end of the year, the white, like my side of the whiteboard where I hung like my schedule and everything was jam packed of pictures that she drew me. But every time she gave me a new picture, she would talk more. And then all of a sudden I was like, she actually talks a lot. And so yeah. like, I remember joking with the science teacher, like, oh, sometimes she talks too much. Like as soon as she opens up now, it's like, you know, you open up the floodgate, but I'd rather her talk too much then feel like she wasn't welcome in our classroom or that she was she couldn't um uh share with us another thing she loved baking for the class and so um i remember one day um i started doing this thing where i just used to say like things that i appreciate about them just randomly and i was like oh you know what i appreciate about vanessa she loves baking for us and that just shows how much she really cares and again her whole face just lit up and everyone's like yeah she does always bake for us thank you vanessa that's really you know and then they all started giving her um accolades and she felt really good so you just have to study your kids you know and yeah. um sometimes you know like we were saying earlier pulling them to the side and just you know, saying, oh, I'm just checking on you. How are you? You know, how's your sister? If you know they have a sister in the school or something, just again, like you said, we keep going back to the same theme, building relationships, but you have to study them, you know, and sometimes it can be a lot because as teachers, we have a lot on our plates, you know what I mean? And we're worried about a thousand things, but I feel like the primary thing it has to be the students, yes. you know? So. Always. It's always only ever about the students, I think. And so if, with students, I feel like they, they, a lot of times you feel invisible, right? I know that in high school, I was well behaved. I didn't do great work. I had everyone's radar. And I'm pretty sure not one teacher I ever had in high school or, or beyond, like, ever kind of noticed me, right? And I, and I don't, and, and I say that in a way, like, I didn't, I didn't ask for that, though. I didn't need it. I had my friends, I had parents that loved me. And so, um, but there are certain kids that I feel like fly below the radar and definitely feel invisible so the things i do is i stand at my door in between every period i shake every hand of every kid that comes in and if i know you're as quiet i'll like look you in your eye when i'm shaking your hand and say hey 
David, I'm really glad that you're here today. Like no, like no nonsense. I'm glad that you're in my class. And then one of my the other steps I think helps is uh, I'll ask some of the seniors or some of the older guys sometimes, and I'll say, Yo, look, I have this new freshman. He's super quiet. I just want him to feel like he's brotherhood's a big thing uh, is a is a big thing for me. So I like the kid, the boys to feel this sense of brotherhood. And I'll say, I need this dude to feel some love. Would you mind if you see him in the hallway, just say, yo, what's up? And and they do. They they take a lot of pride in just saying like, hey, David, what's up? Yo, David. Hey, man. Um, and that makes kids feel like I think that they're not invisible. They actually mm-hmm. exist. People see them. They don't know why these guys are saying hi to them. They don't act. They don't treat them like a charity case. They don't, you know, uh, do too much. But it's just a, hey, what's up? Hey, what's going on? Or at the most... Like, hey, Reynolds told me that you're in his classes this year and you're doing a really great job. That kind of goes a long way to help kids feel seen. And then they, you know, you'd be surprised once people feel accepted, how much they're willing, that helps their confidence, helps them open up. Uh, especially if you're a tiny three foot freshman and some yeah. behemoth is saying, <laughs> you, know, it. you know, that is a big deal, you know, like that the big guys love what you're saying. Uh, oh, so someone suggested something on this topic. Uh, Beatrice Fairbanks said she's suggesting a book called Fish in a Tree by Linda Malay Hunt. Uh, she said it's a great book about students who are shy and that play invisible. I'm going to link that in the description oh, below. Oh, thank you for that. So we can, we can check that out. Is this the other question? Mm-hmm. All right. So my wife is saying this is probably our last question. It's pretty yeah. – she said it could be a long, a long right. answer for this. Uh, <laughs> This is from my friend, Detroit teacher, 20 years in the game. And she says, what are your opinions on the shortage of teachers, in particular African-American teachers? Um, oh, I didn't hear. You broke up said, a little. Sure. What is your opinion on the shortage of teachers and in particular African-American teachers? What's, what's your take on that? Um, it's a major problem. Um, and... I think it's teacher like teachers of color in general. Um, it's a, a major problem. Um, I feel like uh, the I don't even know where to start with this topic, yeah. but um, I feel like it's become the issue has become um, like there's awareness being brought to the issue now. I know um, in particular in New York City, um, f- um, going back to uh, Mayor Michael um, Bloomberg, there have been initiatives to recruit more African American teachers, especially African American male teachers, because that is really where the major deficit is. Um, um, and so in New York City, um, now we have this program, New York City Men Teach. And so it's all about grooming um, male teachers of color um, for the classroom. I know that, like, um, the uh, Teach for America. Uh, I remember last year, I'm not sure what they're doing now, but I remember last year they had a campaign to recruit more teachers of colors and more um, male teachers of color. Um, I think representation is important. I think that students of color need to see teachers who look like themselves in the classrooms. Um, I think they need a variety of teachers because that's the reality of the world. And But I do think it's important for them to see um, teachers who look like themselves, number one, so that they know um, so they have something to aspire to, right? So that they know that this is something that is actually possible for them. Like they can go, they can get um, college degrees and master's degrees and train and become an educator and impact lives in the same way that the people who are in front of them every day are impacting lives. Um, yeah. Also in terms of being able to relate to um, students. So earlier I said, um, you know, when my students in bed style, in terms of socioeconomic status, I wasn't able to connect with them. But in terms of race relations, I could. You know what I mean? And there are just certain experiences that people of color have that only people of color understand, right? And so it's important that they have educators who can talk to them in certain ways. And then schools need these educators so that they can help to teach all the other teachers in the building about like, okay, so this is how we need to approach it. This is the reality of what's going on. This is the seriousness. And I know I've had to do that on a a number of occasions. Like, um, you know, I think educators in general mean well. But I think when it comes to topics of race and and, and injustice, that it becomes very uncomfortable. 
and um, that a lot of um, non teachers who are not of color like to take a color blindness approach to it like oh like well I don't see color in my students but that's not that's actually not fair to your students it's actually detrimental to your students and um, it's not an effective strategy so schools need to have teachers of color there to help um, make sure that these conversations direction and that we're all working together to figure out the best way to help our students understand what they are seeing and witnessing in the world, how we can um, adjust our curriculum to effectively address these issues, and then how we can all like encourage our students to take action, right? Because we can enlighten them um, to what is going on, but if they feel powerless, then what's the point? You know, so... Um, I think we do definitely need more teachers of color um, that, you know, schools of education need to do better jobs of recruiting teachers of color. Um, I feel like, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know what it is about um, the field of education that may not be as appealing to um, people of color. It could be like a monetary thing because teachers don't make that much money um, and like that belief that's instilled in us very young like oh you have to be a doctor or a lawyer you know in order to be successful so i think work has to be done there too to to understand that being an educator is actually a really important work you know um i always see being a teacher as being like ministry you know i don't see it i see it as a calling i don't see it as just a job um and so i think uh changes need to occur in a lot of areas yeah you're you're really saying every single thing that I would absolutely say there. And uh, so some of the things I, I just kind of want to reiterate is that this idea of like not seeing color, I, you know, for me, like I get it, right? Like, and I've, I've already alluded to this before that like I talk to my students and I say, look, I get it. I'm a white guy and I come from a middle-class family. And so I think part of white privilege is not realizing that have white privilege, right? So like uh, when I have students that get pulled over and they tell me I wasn't even doing anything, you know, I, I like if you hear that enough times, it makes you start to, to wonder about that stuff. And so I, I think the good part about my students having me as a teacher is that I am the they students always often talk about, right? When they're like, yeah, you go into their like a store like that and they always look at you or they, you know, those cops, they treat you this way. And I'm like, well, who's they? Like, let's break that down for a second because you know who I am and I try to be pretty fair and just with, with my guys. And so I think that you're right. Like having different teachers from that do not look like you, like, um, and our school is pretty eclectic, like um, folks from Pakistan and Asian women and Hispanic and Indian, like, and I think that is really good. But I'll tell you that no one gets the respect and the the kind of like creates the sort of magnetism that African-American teachers have for African-American students. So my school is like 99 percent African-American students. We have like the one white kid, the one Asian kid and the one Pakistani kid that we pull in for all the pictures. So like our brochures look diverse, but uh, it's largely all African-American students. And when a male comes in, you're right. I think that that looks like you and that has a college degree or a master's or a doctorate, when you're talking about boys that like 90% of them, of 90% or so of my students do not have a father that's either at home or around, mm -hmm. and you have a male that takes interest in you, that is that tells you you're doing a good job, that tells you education is important, that message is carried with a different sort of gravity than anyone else. Because I can be the kind of dad maybe to my kids at my, and I talk about my, my own children all the time in school. And I can, I sense this feeling of students of like, uh, like I've had times where they've been really jealous. Like I'll bring my son into school and some kids are like really accepting. And then other kids just kind of look at them like, Oh, like you really get that. You know, like you, you have Mr. Reynolds for a dad. And, but because of become white, I feel like it, it's like they just can't see like growing up to be me is not an option. Mm -hmm. But when someone comes in that looks like you, it's just, it's everything. And so I think that it's not just a shortage of teachers. 
I think it's a shortage of teachers that are willing to stick it out for the long run because everyone wants to teach for a hot minute. They want to come in for a year or two and say, you know, I taught in the hood or I did this really good deed and now I can go on to bigger and better things. And I think students need people that are going to stay in the classroom, that are going to show up day after day, year after year, 10 years down the road when you had a bad day or you, or you did something great. I want my guys to be able to still come back Room 106, Reynolds is still sitting there in the same, like, I, I, I used to have all brown hair. I have kids that come back now, they're like, Reynolds, what's up? They're like, like the silver fox all of a sudden. Um, you know, I, I turned into Anderson Cooper overnight. But I love that idea of, like, 20 years down the road, kids being able to come back and see me. Because that's what so many of our students, especially at Title I schools, need is there's so much inconsistency. They need people that are going to stay the course, even though this job is hard as hell sometimes. And so I just think that that is, is so important. So I could not agree with you more. Oh, um, we have, there's two more questions that I think, are they piggybacks? Do you have, a, do you have a couple more minutes so we could just do these real quick? Okay, cool. Um, Oh, th this is the girl whose name I'm going to ruin again. I apologize. Vance. Ne Nayara Almedia. I'm going to say that. Uh, was that close? I think it was close. Uh, how do you deal with students? Uh, how do you deal with student dreams and professional expectations? Are you honest and realistic about what a student is capable of? So what do you do when your kids have like seemingly unreal expectations? Like I always get these kids in ninth grade that have like Fs in every class and they're like, I'm going to Princeton, Mr. Reynolds. I don't know about you. I'm going to doctor. And I'm like, I don't know what the F's. Like, we might have to talk about that and figure out a better path for you or figure out how to get you there uh, better than, than you're kind of like on the track right now. So uh, what, what do you, how do you deal with that stuff? Yeah, I, I deal with it the same way. I'm just honest with them um, and make sure in, in my honesty, I'm still very affirming. Um, so when I was teaching, um, 11th grade in Brooklyn, um, I had a lot of students like that. They, one student in particular who I still, um, in, I'm in communication with, he was big on going to MIT, you know, and it was just like the name of the school. He didn't know anything about requirements or anything like that. And, and when I started getting a pulse of the schools that they were all interested in, I realized that, okay, we need to have a really honest conversation. So I just went, we went, I pulled up um, different schools on the smart board and said, okay, let's look at the admissions requirements. And we went through that and they were all like, oh, oh. And so at first they became discouraged and I'm like, but that, that's not the end of the story. Like you want to be an engineer. There are other really amazing engineering programs that you can apply to at a school that is more affordable, um, has just as amazing educators as this, you know, big name school that you want to go to. And look, you only have to have an 85 average to get in as opposed to, you know, a 95 or you only need this SAT score to get in. And so just, um, exposing them to um, other options, not shooting down their dreams at all, but showing them that either they need to take alternate routes to get to that dream or um, make a plan. Okay, well, you have this amount of time. Realistically, what can you achieve to get you closer to that place? Like, I don't ever want to shoot down anyone's dreams. You know, I've had teachers who have done that to me, who have done that to my siblings. And like, you know, I've seen the damage of that. Like my sister's fifth grade science teacher said something to her that, you know, she only recently got over and she's in her forties, you know? So I never want to shoot down anyone's dream, but like, just be realistic with them and like try to help them figure out other ways or maybe other things that they're interested in, you know, something like that. Yeah. I, I, I believe it. And it's, you know, I, I think being a hundred percent real students, but in a way that is empowering is really important because I have a lot of students. I always have this. I'll always have at least one guy in the freshman class that says, I want to be a football player or a basketball player. And I'll say, all right, well, like, what position do you play? And they'll go, well, I'm not really, I'm not on the team now. It's like, well, wait, you want to be a basketball player, but you're not on the basketball team. Well, like, do you play outside of school a lot? Nah, I've been, like, really taken off this year. I'm not really into it. This All right, so, like, I think some of it is, like, reverse engineering why you want to be what you want to be. And a lot a lot of times, for a lot of my it comes down to money. And so it's about, well, why don't we figure out something you actually enjoy doing or you're interested in? 
that you can make a living off of or you can achieve whatever dream it is that you have. Like you want to take care of your mom. You don't want your grandma to have to work anymore. Well, let's like, let's take a look at that and figure out which path is going to work for you. And yeah, like you said, like go to the college admissions office and say, if we were to do this, like how much money does this cost a year? Is there a more cost effective way to get there? And because a lot for a lot of my students, they're first generation uh, college students. So they don't have a sense of like, they, they don't have, they can't go to their mom and ask, or a lot of times like their parents are in school and they don't, they see how hard that is. And it's very daunting to them. And, and it's like trying to tell kids like, yeah, man, when you have four kids and you go back to college, like it's hard. Cause you're already working when you're 20. Like it shouldn't be like in retrospect, it was really, I had more time than I knew what to do with. Now I'm like, teaching and doing YouTube and raising two kids and like, and then I have this dog now also. It's like, <laughs> you know, you have way less time. So helping kids realize what they're actually capable of and then just keep reminding them like over and over and over again of what they're capable of is super important. A lot of students aren't getting that from anywhere else except for school. And you might not be the only teacher that's doing it, but as a community of teachers, you need to really like keep helping kids in, in that capacity, I think. Um, last question is from Y Nito. It says, what is the moment in your career that will stay with you forever? What? Oh, that's I, a great ending question. What I is a moment? Sure. What is a moment from your career that will stay with you forever? Um, I feel like I talk about this all the time. Um, when I, my first year at the all boys school, I had a student who was um, dyslexic and he had um, a few other uh, uh, disabilities. Um, and, you know, a lot of teachers told me like, he's not going to read, he's not going to do any work. He's a great kid, but you're not going to get him to do anything. Um, and by working with him closely, building relationships, when he had his moments, you know, where he, you know, got upset with me for asking him to read and stuff like that, um, going through those kind of things with him and just really showing him that I cared by the end, by the end of the school year. So this was, he was in seventh grade. He's going to the 12th grade, um, uh, this school year, um, yeah. by the end of the seventh grade, he was asking his mom to buy him books on his Kindle. Um, he had improved so greatly and he is just like, like he's like a, a major success story and gem of that school. And to think that this was someone who, you know, people were saying to me like, oh, like, please don't even try with him because he's not going to, um, if I would have listened to them, he would never be where he is now. And I think every teacher has to understand their role in a kid's life along their path to success. So who he had before didn't really believe in him, but I did, so that gave him confidence. And then the next teacher believed in him and that gave him more confidence. And now he's going to be a high school graduate, right? Someone who could barely read. So that's definitely one of my favorite stories. Yeah, I think those sort of stories where you weren't, really sure what was going to happen with a kid and then they exceed your expectations are the best. And, and so one of mine actually came this summer and a student that I had three, he's going to be a senior this year. He was a freshman in high school. He's on the spectrum, um, had a lot of difficulties growing up to the point where like mom showed up on the, like, I think on the day of school, like after school and just, so nervous about sending him to our school and was uh at back to school night she came in again she was in tears she's so nervous i just said like i got it like i i got your guy for the next four years i need you to know that i'm going to look out for him no matter what and he emailed me over the summer that uh, uh he went on an outward bound trip for 25 days or something in north carolina they stayed in the woods for 25 days slept in tents for 25 days and this is a guy that never like his mom would call me in the summer and say could you do something because he's he will not leave the house all he does is stay in and read books all the time he doesn't associate with anyone else and so him to to go away and do something like that um and then i found out over the summer he also went to the dominican republic for like two weeks on some sort of ambassador like like really wow. great stuff but it's like man, you are 
Like, I don't know that I can take all the credit for that, but like to just see kids grow despite their limitations is, it just, it really, really empowers you as a teacher to like keep going and to think you just don't know. Like, all the kids that come in that you might discount at the beginning of the year or shake your head and think, how am I ever supposed to deal with this? Like, you know, if you've done it before, you can do it again. And that is really it just like that email set me up for the year where I just thought like, I can't wait. Like, I, I, I'm excited to get back in there. Like, I want to hear his whole story. And then I want to use him as an example for every other kid that ever complains about anything. I'll be like, <laughs> This dude did this. Like, what now? Like, all right. What? So, how bad is is your situation? Um, and and I think that can be empowering to the other students as well. This was such a great conversation. This was Thank so, you so much. much fun. Thank you so much for inviting me. We went way over, but I'm I like those. I, your, your answers were like I was. I didn't. I, you know, you can't. You get a certain sense of who people are on social media. You know, like we all know this, but like. Uh, I, we were like, um, I just loved all your answers. I feel like I didn't even have to answer those questions. You were saying all the same stuff going to. So could you real quick tell people where they could find you on social media so they can follow you on Instagram and stuff? Yeah, so I'm Ms. Urban, Urban Educator, MZ Urban Educator on Twitter and Instagram. Great. So I'm going to link all of your stuff and your TPT stuff and everything in my YouTube video underneath. And um, I, I just want to invite you that if, if you do go on my YouTube channel and you see this video up there, people may ask questions of you underneath and just go ahead and like, feel free to like drop any information in there no, that you want. No and, uh, because this was such a great talk. I'm sure that, that people have questions for you. So thanks so much for being on. I really, really okay. appreciate it. See you on YouTube. All right. <laughs> All right. I hope you have the best school year. Bye. Uh, thank you. There we go. All right. Go so, now I'm talking to myself on your computer. Um, so that was awesome. I love when I'm like pleasantly surprised. You just don't always know because you know you only know people from their Instagram pictures. That was awesome. So on Thursday we have former California Teacher of the Year Alex Kajitani, and I know there's tons of people on here that watch that are in California. Kate and Darren and everyone else. He is known as the rapping mathematician, and I, you, you got you can Google this dude. He's been on like Dateline. He's been on ABC. He's been on which I think is Dateline. He's done TED Talks. He's all over the place. He is so unassuming. You would never ever think that he's as awesome as he is. Up to him on Thursday. So that'll be on Thursday at 8 p.m. And then that will be our last Thursday teacher talk for some time. We'll go back to just Tuesday nights after that because the school year kicks off and. You know, I'd be a dad sometimes, so that's what I'm going to go do. Everybody, thank you so much. If I didn't get to your question, please go ahead and leave it in the comment section below, and I will answer, I promise. And that's it. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Peace.